Welcome to Intro Psychology Unit 6, Learning and Behaviorism. This unit will focus primarily on what we talked about in, in Unit 1 in the area on behavioral psychology. And learning is not what you commonly define as learning, you know, studying books and thinking, but learning in this section is going to refer to permanent changes in behavior. So let's get to it. So when we think about learning as defined by behavioral psychologists, we're really thinking about explicit and implicit changes in behavior. These might be things that you're aware of that have changed and therefore they'd be explicit, or there might be things that you don't even notice you're doing different and therefore would be implicit. These do not mean studying facts from a book and understanding more knowledge or remembering things. If you think back to unit one, behaviorists define psychology as a natural science of observable behaviors that had no room for the internal thought process. And so they were not concerned about our thoughts, our cognitions, our feelings, our decisions. They were only interested in our observable behavior on the outside. So because of that, they're really only looking at a permanent change in your behavior, not changes in your thoughts or your knowledge or your understanding. So in this unit, we're really going to talk about the things we do. Now, a common misconception about this unit, we're going to talk a lot about how we can manipulate the behaviors of others. And that can sound pretty nefarious. It's important to understand that whether you study behavioral psychology or you don't, we are all constantly influencing those around us. There's a constant bi-directional and trans-directional effect in almost every interaction we have with another person or an animal that understanding how these interactions work and how we influence each other is not necessarily evil. You could certainly use this knowledge for not so good to things, but behavioral psychology is not just used by cold-blooded uh, manipulators. It's also the primary way that teachers and parents help to shape and mold their children and students. So this can be used for really, really benevolent reasons as well. Let's just keep that in mind. Often we see how behaviorism can be applied to the behavioral sciences, such as using non-human animals in research, such as rats or pigeons. And that's very true. But it's important to understand that we have lots of other human-led interventions focusing on behaviorism, such as a lot of therapies for children on the autism spectrum, a lot of relationship therapies and couples therapy rely on behaviorism. And this can be a primary force in terms of getting over addictions and getting over phobias. So there's lots of human applied ideas in here as well. So let's drill down a little bit more what we mean in learning. Well, we talked a little bit in unit four about sensory adaptation, how we may become more sensitive or less sensitive to things in the environment around us. And that is a primary mechanism in behavioral psychology. This adaptation can take two ways. Uh, the first way is habituation. This is when you become less sensitized or desensitized to something over time. And we tend to become habituated when we find something is not dangerous, not informative, and not interesting. So these are things that we don't need to pay attention to. If you think about Unit 5 when we talked about the consciousness and all the possible stimuli that could be on our spotlight stage in our consciousness at once, we have to pick. And we're going to choose not to pick the things that are more dull or less interesting in our lives. So this means that if you're used to the smells of your house, if you're used to the smell of your pet's fur or the, the ingredients you commonly cook with at home, you're going to become less uh, sensitized to those over time. In addition, you'll become less sensitized to products like the smell of your shampoo or your deodorant or other personal care products. Then we have sensitization. This is the idea that you become more aware of things over time. And this often is because your brain has identified these things as informative or dangerous or alarming or very interesting to you. So when you change your ringtone on your phone, you may not recognize it the first couple of times, but then you become hyper aware of the text notifications if you just have a new app with a new sound. Now, these can be very complex. In everyday life, we may be constantly going up and becoming more sensitized and going down and becoming more habituated at, to many different things at once. If you think about someone who's driving a car, it's possible that as they get more experience driving the car, they pay less attention to where their foot is on the pedals. It becomes more automatic. It's not taking that spotlight up in their brain. Instead, they may be spending more time focusing on uh, dangerous driving and defensive driving and paying attention to what other motorists are doing or what spontaneous pedestrians might be doing. That would probably be very successful. We can imagine what would happen if you become more habituated to seeing pedestrians and you don't focus on them. Then when one does something very spontaneous, you may be less prepared to react. So it's important to understand that this 
adaptation is constantly going on. No matter if we're interacting with other people or just inanimate objects, it's a constant process. So in addition to being more accustomed to what's going on in our environment, we also are hardwired to detect patterns in our environment. That is, we don't just notice individual stimuli, we start to correlate and connect the dots. This is something that humans are capable of doing early on in infancy. We know that infants, when they drop something from their high chair and they hear the splat, they will constantly drop it and it's not to irritate their caregivers. It's actually because they're really interested in the scientific experiment, they drop something and it falls. And they will do that repetitively until they master it and understand, oh, this, this motion has this result. So this starts early on in infancy and we continue to connect the dots over our lifespan. For instance, we might notice that when the sun is warmer, we crave ice cream more often. Or when the sun is warmer in the summer, we see more flowers. And so we start to associate patterns in nature and patterns in our social worlds. Sometimes this can lead us astray. Um, we'll talk more about that in Psych 201 when we get to social psychology and stereotypes and how connecting those dots could be false positives. But for the purposes of this course, it's important to understand that our brains are ready made to make these connections and our brains are ready made to find patterns in the world around us. So when we talk about learning in terms of behavioral psychology, it's the ability to find these connections and use these connections to change our behavior. And we use these connections based on what we're becoming more sensitized to and not what we're becoming more habituated. To.